Very good morning indeed, Buona Deminazza. It's a pleasure to be back at the Institute. I have been here a couple of times. Uh, I was involved a long time ago in the uh, reform of the curriculum of the Institute. So that was, of course, a very important uh, in the transition period. And I have been back a couple of times for training. So a uh, pleasure is mine. You're all prosecutors and judges. Um, you have seen for my first um, contribution, my first uh, intervention, my first lecture, I have chosen a rather, maybe for some of you, a rather strange topic. Why? Because I'm dealing with EU agencies or bodies, so coming from the European Union, and the first one that I will tackle is even not a judicial authority. It's an administrative authority, and that's of course for prosecutors. And for judges in criminal law and criminal matters, it might be strange, but you will understand why. Uh, the second one, uh, also for, uh, for my session this morning, is something that still has to be set up. It has been decided. It will become um, in force from 2020 on, and that's a European Public Prosecutor's Office. Uh, I think it's an important topic for the future, certainly in dealing with some economic and financial crimes. And uh, Romania is participating in that, in that new office. Not all countries of the EU were willing to do so, but Romania does. So that's the reason why I have chosen these two topics for this morning. Maybe a first question before you will see how I will tackle it. Has any one of you experience with the anti-fraud office of the European Union called OLAF? That's the French acronym, Office de la Lutte Anti-Fraude. Have everyone in your daily experience as a prosecutor, or as a judge, ever come across this agency or evidence from this agency? Nobody? Yeah, that's maybe a luck, <laughs> because it complicates life, but it can also be very helpful. Uh, they are working, of course, a lot together with, uh, at the police level, uh, with the anti-corruption unit and, and things like that. But anyway. What I will do, how I will tackle it, I already informed the translators or the interpreters about it. I will, I will not use uh, further uh, the, the PowerPoint, it is just a scheme of my contribution. I will elaborate here on the flap over a concrete case to make it as visible as possible. And in the first part I, deal, I will deal with the existing uh, anti-fraud unit uh, or anti-fraud office of the Union and to see what are they doing and what can they do, what can they not do and what is the relevance for the judicial authorities, prosecutors and judges. And in the second part then I will explain the difference, the main difference with this new body, the European Public Prosecutor's Office and also its limits. Okay? If I go too fast Certainly the interpreters will say something about it, but also if I'm not clear on certain concepts, uh, don't be afraid to intervene. Yeah? Okay. If I may, I take off my jacket because it's warm. And there we go. So the first thing I will do is elaborate my practical case. And you will elements in it, yeah, it's really, <laughs> um, that are very important to understand the substantive law and the procedural law, and also the link, of course, with judicial work. Let me... <laughs> yes, yes, it's... Uh... <laughs> We call it a, a single legal area because we are in the European Union. Going away, uh, yeah. yeah? Yes, yes, that's uh, very sensitive. No, yes, yes. It's very sensitive. We will see. Otherwise, I use this one, eh? maybe it's better. Shall we try? No, I don't think. Yeah, but I cannot write and see it. That's impossible. 
make a test. A yeah. short test. Can see if Both microphones or only one? Uh, only that one. Because, yeah. So if I speak like that, can you hear me? Maybe that's better than this. Huh? Yeah. Just give me a sign so I speak a little bit louder, okay? So I use a single legal space, the space of the, what we have called, the common territory of the member states. Because we are all in the Union, including Romania, although there are some limits, as you know, uh, when it comes to free movement of persons in the Schengen area, but yeah, that's a question of time. I, I build in here jurisdictions, that means territories of member states. I build in the Netherlands, I build in, you will see why, I build in Italy, and I will use also some external states, third parties, third parties as we call them. What is my, here I have a company. We are speaking here about economic and financial offenses. A lot of these offenses, not all of them, are related to legal persons. When I say legal persons, that depends on the definition in business law, but also the definition in criminal law. A lot of countries in the European Union have criminal liability of legal persons, including Romania. Most of them have it. The exceptions are very few, like Germany. So I have here a firm, and the firm, of course, is a legal person in the Netherlands, seat in Rotterdam, the biggest harbor, and the firm is, is involved in commercial conduct. As you will see, not all the conduct is as legal as it should be. My first conduct, I put it here in blue, I'm importing Cigarettes, Marlboro, what you want, from Panama, Central America. And I put the cigarettes here in a warehouse in the Rotterdam Harbor. Is this strange? No, it's not strange at all. Why not? Because I buy the cigarettes legally to a producer with a license in Panama which has a license of Philip Morris International, so the main company. And I put here it in a warehouse in Rotterdam, which is very, it's a customs procedure. So we are in EU customs law. So it's very normal. Is this type of economic behavior strange? No, because Rotterdam is the biggest harbor for trade in tobacco products for Europe and Africa. So, nothing suspicious from the first sight. Of course, as a businessman here, or a legal person, I'm not interested in cigarettes and warehousing. I have to sell them. So, I put them in transport, or in transit, officially said, that's another customs procedure, to where? To Montenegro. Third country, still. So we're in the Balkans. On paper, or digitally spoken, every, every today the customs procedure is digitalized. On paper, the cigarettes here are cleared. That means the customs authorities in Montenegro are saying to the customs authorities in the Netherlands, they did arrive, they correspond. So, it's okay. The whole procedure is cleared. In reality, something else happens. So this is the virtual reality, or the paper reality if you want. I go to the real reality. What I've been doing, I complicate it a little bit, I have set up a sub-company in Poland for the transport. Why? Because it's cheaper, just the market. The drugs are cheaper, the drivers are cheaper. And this is this labor dumping that we have a problem with in the Union. Okay, the trucks are legally doing this, but a part of the trucks is not going to the Balkans or to Montenegro. It's going to the south of Italy. So that means that a part of the cigarettes don't arrive at Montenegro, but they arrive directly here in the south of Italy, Puglia. 
Calabria, yeah, Calabria is the other side. <laughs> and some of the trucks are going to Montenegro, but in reality, the cigarettes are coming also to Puglia by speedboats. It's not so far away. So in reality, my end destination is not a third country. It's within the EU market. So it is within the internal market. If you put it in criminal law terms, the Treaty of Lisbon is speaking, the area of freedom, security and justice. That's our com common judicial area. Okay, what is my interest to have a reality digital or on paper and a real reality, so bringing the cigarettes by two, the red ones, to Puglia? What is my business interest? Avoiding Italian taxes. Um, certainly avoiding taxes. If they are Italian, that remains to be seen. But if you buy, if you buy, it will not be different than Romania, I suppose. If you buy a packet of cigarettes, the the price, the end price you buy in a shop, in a legal shop, about 85 to 90 percent are taxes indeed. So if you avoid these taxes, the price of your product is very very little. What type of taxes? Hmm? Axes, excises, special excises on tobacco products. That's a national tax mostly. So this depends on the countries. So that would be an Italian tax, you're right. VAT, we come back to what the other will speak about it. VAT taxes are very important because of course it can be 21, 22 or 23 percent for such a product. So that's quite relevant. And Yeah, that's linked to, normally because I don't import in the Union, officially. But in reality I do. So there are custom duties to be paid. That depends of course on the country of origin, the product and so on and so on. So I have three types of taxes. Excises, VAT and custom duties. They all have been avoided. I come back to that. My second one, because I have all these trucks going direction of Montenegro, you know the European Union is giving a lot of humanitarian aid or assistance if you want to third countries, certainly the countries that want to become member of the Union in the neighborhood policy. So the Union is financing here in, in, the, in candidate countries uh, the, the rule of law, and the, the banker has left, but there are many programs. And so I, the Commission of the European Union is setting in the market through tendering procedures, contracts, for bringing the services to the place. So I'm transporting not only cigarettes, but let's say also computers to the same place. And I got this contract at the Commission through a tendering procedure. Between us, and that's interesting to know, so I put here something in red. I did pay to the civil servant of the Commission 5% of the contract under the table. That's my second one. My third one. Um, the, the same legal person. We are at a period, I go a little bit back in time, but I think it's a speaking example. Unfortunately, all these examples are real. I just combined them. My third one, this legal person is buying in another jurisdiction. I put here the United Kingdom. You know, they're about to leave, but they were still in and they are still in. This legal person is buying in the United Kingdom meat. So in the common agriculture market. At the time of the mad cow disease, you remember that? Okay. If there is a disease like the mad cow, the union comes in with an awful lot of money because the animals have to be destroyed. The meat has to be destroyed. 
farmers have to uh, get money as a compensation, otherwise they go bankrupt. So uh, there's a lot of EU subsidy in, linked to the common agricultural policy. What is this firm doing? They buy on the black market destroyed meat. You understand? It has not been destroyed. They buy it very cheap for some pennies. They bring it to the Netherlands from here to here and then they export this meat to Russia. This is a real case, huh? On the labels of the meat is written high quality Belgian meat. At that time, there was no mad cow disease yet in Belgium. It started in the United Kingdom. So, of course, the product is not corresponding at all. Be careful. This export to Russia is subsidized. So, I get subsidies for exporting to Russia. From whom? From the Netherlands, but the money is coming from the EU budget. Why do we subsidize this? Yes, we have interest in exporting meat and of course the prices in the Union are much higher than in Russia so we are not competitive on the market and the Union is paying the difference. Depends on the type of the product and the country of uh, destination and so on and so on. You can imagine that I earn an awful lot of money. The problem is that most of my money is illegal. Most of my assets are illegal because this business <coughs> is very tricky. Uh, you might have understood that, of course, here as a businessman, I have a good understanding, a very good understanding with the producers, with the local mafia in Puglia, with my trade partners here in Montenegro, we are a criminal network, guys, <laughs> because we have also to control this network. There's a lot of competition also there. So, of course, all the income of this organized crime stuff, I cannot declare it to my tax authority here in the Netherlands. I have to hide it. Also, here on this thing, I, of course, <coughs> I can declare a part of it, but I have to be careful. So, it means I have a lot of black assets black income. What I do, I invest quite a part of it in financial products in Luxembourg. And of course I give orders, I do that in a very complicated way, I set up another company, so I'm invisible, I give orders to third persons, and these financial products are running all over the world. And a part of it comes back to me in a clean way. So, this is an operation, of course, you understand that directly, of money laundering. Okay. Here I come to my first body. The Anti-Fraud Office of the European Union, OLAF. It's in place with different names now for about 30 years. When can they come in? This has to do with my material scope. And the same, but then I have to explain it a little bit more in detail, at least at the beginning, will be the case for the European Public Prosecutor's Office. For OLAF, there must be a link with what is called the financial interests of the Union. It's called like that in the terminology, protection of the financial interests. That means it's related to the budget of the Union. So there we have to understand how the budget of the Union is financed. And you will say, yeah, why as judges or prosecutors we are interested in the budget? It looks like uh, uh, accountants. No, no. We also, as judges and prosecutors, we are also interested in the budget of the state, isn't it? When you speak about tax fraud, it's also the budget. So the budget has an income side and an expenditure side. Where is the money of the Union coming from? Customs, Custom duties, custom duties a, a part of the VAT, 100%. custom duties, 100%. The, full, the, full, the full set. So all here, I don't pay custom duties on the cigarettes, 
This is a, a fraud directly against, 100% against the budget of the EU. VAT is more complicated, it's partially. It's, yeah, it depends a little, it's very technical, but the, the, the biggest part of the VAT, far the biggest part is going to the states, but the small part is also going to the budget of the EU. So that means already here in my uh, cigarettes case, I have in fact a violation of national interest for VAT and a violation of EU interest for VAT and customs fraud, both. You will, you will come back to that, I think. Where is the money going to? That's the expenditure side of the budget. Subsidies. Yes, mostly subsidies. Of course, very important and, uh, for a country in Romania, Customs certainly. Customs authorities. Yeah, but mostly, yes, but mostly are related to policies, of course. So, traditionally very important, the Union was the common agriculture policy. But today, the biggest part of expenditure is in structural funds. If you, uh, if you travel around, uh, it will be not, dif not different in Romania, you will see many, many references to EU, to EU structural funds because they have been building a new road, they have been building a harbor, uh, whatever you can imagine, with an enormous flow of money. Here my example, of course, of the subsidies with export to Russia are linked to the common agriculture policy. So it's also related to the budget. Linked to that is, and therefore that I build in that example of the computers, the union, about 12% of the expenditure of the union is not challenged through the member states. All the rest goes through the member states. So if Romania is spending EU money, at a certain moment it has to declare it to the commission and then they see if everything is okay. But there is some money that is going directly. So it doesn't go through the member states. We call it direct spending or direct contracting. As I said, I got a contract for the delivery of the computers to Montenegro by the Commission in an open tendering procedure. So that means the area of fraud and corruption within the EU institutions, it not necessarily has a budgetary impact, it could be, but that's also part of the mandate of Olaf. Okay, you still follow me? Yeah. So what if Olaf has substantive competence, material competence? Of course, the first thing what we have to know, if we speak about, I said it's an administrative body, it's an administrative agency, not a judicial one. So if we speak about illegal behavior, we have to qualify it. We can qualify it under administrative law. In the EU language, then we have irregularities, call it administrative infractions. And we have, of course, criminal law offenses. Some of my behavior will be both. It can be an administrative irregularity and a criminal offense. Where will I find that? I will not go into details and you will get through the organization a package of materials also uploaded, so don't worry too much about that. It's harmonized by EU law. EU law is saying, here concretely in a directive, what the criminal law offenses are related to the budget. So which violations of financial interest of the Union should be a criminal offense in the member states? And that for the income side and for the expenditure side. Everything I have described here must be criminal offences under Romanian law, no doubt. It depends most not on the conduct, it depends also on the mens rea. If it from the very moment it is, men, it is intentional, then I'm in the criminal law area for sure. Yeah, in my business here, I don't think there is much, much doubt about it, although a prosecutor has to prove it, of course, before a judge. But as I presented it, I was very open with you. It's, uh, this can be very difficult, non-intentional, uh, because the, the aim is very clear. So that means when Olaf opens an investigation, institutionally that's already complicated, Olaf is part of the European Commission. 
but the, the sector on investigation of OLAF is independent. So the OLAF uh, director can open an investigation on own initiative or informed by authorities of member states. They run an administrative investigation based on EU law and they can investigate in the member states and in the European institutions. We call that technically internal investigations in the institutions and external investigations in the member states. I first concentrate on the external ones. Why could they be interested here in this firm, this Dutch firm and the business? I take this case of the mad cow disease. The commission was informed at the time, the real case, about a strange increase in export of meat to Russia. Many containers. Coming from a firm which was not involved in any business with meat before and certainly also not with Russia. A newcomer. Something was smelling. Then they found out, I don't know why, so the Commission found out, that there had been corruption involved here in this case. How? Some officials of the Inspectorate of Agriculture in the Netherlands, who have to check these things, had been paid <coughs> in order to be blind. Why is this important? So if the Commission here was alerting Olaf, Olaf can open an investigation. Normally, I summarize it here, but normally they ask the member state to do that. So they ask a, an, an administrative authority to open an, a, an administrative investigation. In Romania, this can be customs or whatever, or agriculture and the administrative agencies. All of inspectors can and mostly will join the inspection. So that means when the inspectors arrive here at the firm, it will be a joint inspection team under administrative law, European law and national law. Of course, the national inspectors having competence from national law, the European ones, that's more complicated, that's partially European and partially national. In this case, however, how could you ask at the inspectorate of agriculture in the Netherlands to open an inspection if you have indications that some of them have been bribed? If you do that, your inspection will fail, for sure. So there is another possibility for Olaf, which is more the exception than the rule, that they can go autonomously. But they must have good reasons for that. One, of course, if there is a risk of uh, uh, bribes and, and that the evidence will disappear, then they can go for an autonomous inspection. That means they arrive alone without informing the national authorities, at least not the national administrative authorities. But that's not the end of the story. What will happen here if they arrive at such a firm? Knock, knock. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, it, or the door will remain closed or you get the gun. Yeah, it's, uh, this is tricky business. So what Olaf is doing in such a case is calling in assistance from the member state, but not from the administrative agencies, but mostly from what we call mano militari, from the police authorities. And the member states have the obligation to assist. So in fact, that means they arrive, the police forces are at the corner, and from the very moment of non-cooperation, they come in with national police force, and then Olaf has access to the premises. What can Olaf do in such an inspection? They, under administrative law, they can ask questions. They can see the goods, important here. They can see the business records. So they have, uh, they cannot search, search in the sense of a judicial search, 
So if they don't find what they're looking for, they cannot break down the walls. They can force access to the, to the computers because they are the business records. So there's a duty to cooperate. Uh, passwords and things like that. There are a whole, things, a whole set of things they cannot do because they are not a judicial authority. They cannot infiltrate the criminal organization. They cannot intercept telecommunications. They cannot, they don't have access to bank accounts. That's, you see, that's uh, for financial investigations, it's a very tough limit. But they can do a lot of things. And the advantage is they can investigate in all this area, in all these countries at the same time. So, so inspectors can go to the Netherlands, but at the same time to Italy or to Poland. So for them, this is a common space. Now come some limits, and then I go to the European Public Prosecutor. Olaf has no sanctioning power. You will maybe say, of course. It's not so obvious, because there are other administrative agencies uh, of the Union who have strong sanctioning powers in admin under administrative law. Competition, you certainly have heard of this, uh, uh, the, the, the huge sanctions on Google uh, by the Commission, so DG Competition can sanction. The European Central Bank can sanction banks, and so on and so on. Also, there is an authority on the stock exchange, ESMA, who can sanction. So Olaf is the only one who cannot sanction. What does this mean? If Olaf investigates and they find evidence of illegal behavior, and this illegal behavior is seen, the cases in which they investigate, will be many, many cases criminal conduct. That must be criminalized under national law by the harmonization. So that means that the evidence gathered by Olaf will end up in follow-up proceedings. So Olaf concludes the investigation and they inform what is called the competent authorities. The competent authorities will be, in my case, of course, the Commission, because there is here a civil servant that has been bribed, but will also be relevant competent authorities in the member states. So this report will, certainly in such a case, will be sent to judicial authorities in the relevant member states. That means, at a certain moment, it will arrive at the desk of a prosecutor. What is the status of this report? That's also quite complicated. The Court of Justice, because there have been procedures about that, the Court of Justice of the Union has said that this report is just information. It's just information. It does not change the legal position of the persons concerned. However, the member states, including the judicial authorities, have enforcement obligations under EU law. They cannot just say, oh, a report from a strange body I've never heard of to the bin. No. So they have to take this serious, and they, that depends on the evidence obtained by Olaf is admissible evidence under national law in similar administrative proceedings. If it is admissible and usable evidence in criminal proceedings, that depends on the national law. So for Romania, then you have to check, is evidence coming from a European administrative agency admissible evidence in criminal law? You will say no, <laughs> but there is a but. If evidence coming from national administrative agencies, Romanian ones, is admissible evidence, then the Olaf, man, Olaf one must also be admissible evidence. So it must be the same treatment. But I'm afraid that in Romania you have a, a Chinese wall between them, which is of course also a problem. What does that mean? In Romania then you have to redo all the investigative measures. That's sometimes possible. But it's also possible that some of the evidence has disappeared meanwhile. So this can be a problem. So I summarize on Olaf. Are we going well? Yeah. I summarize on Olaf. You see here a European body 
with an, administ of an administrative nature, but with a strong interlink with the judicial area because of the type of conduct. Uh, they can investigate in the whole single legal area, so that's a big advantage. They have real powers, although limited, but of course they cannot sanction, as I said. And the value of their evidence is strongly dependent upon national law. So that might be that it's very different, for instance, from Romania than in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, evidence obtained by administrative agencies is admissible evidence in criminal proceedings, directly. So very different from the situation in Romania, for instance. If I go, let's just use the same case. I go to the uh, second body, the European Public Prosecutor's Office. The idea of setting up a European Public Prosecutor's Office, that's making, in fact, uh, what the prosecutor is doing at home, making it also European, is an old idea, old. It's on the table for 20 to 30 years. But it's politically very sensitive because certainly when it comes to financial crimes, finance is always a national taboo. And justice and criminal justice is also a national taboo in the sense member states are afraid of making it too European. So they, they don't push, they refrain. Before setting up, I come back to that tomorrow, this European Public Prosecutor's Office, there have been initiatives of member states, not from the Union, that then became Union bodies, to strengthen this cooperation. Uh, you certainly have heard of Eurojust, uh, the cooperation unit for prosecutors uh, having seat in The Hague. Uh, although today they are a, a vertical body, they are an agency of the Union, they are mostly busy with the horizontal cooperation. So, if the Dutch prosecutor is opening here a judicial investigation, and this judicial investigation he might open one because he is alerted by the tax authorities. They say, it is very, very strange there, there's a lot of activity going on, but we, that we don't see money coming in, in, the tax, in the tax budget. And we have indications that there might be organized crime involved, so he opens a judicial investigation. If he finds out the criminal network here, he might call in Eurojust to coordinate this case. I'll come back to that tomorrow. Now I'm speaking about the vertical one, so really the, 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 the supranational uh, European Public Prosecutor's Office. What was the idea behind? Um, and the idea has then been laid down in the Treaty of Lisbon in, in 2009 in Article 86 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. The idea was behind that for certain offenses, so we first we go again, you see, to the material scope, that for certain offenses, and as it stands today, it is limited to the same offenses as Olaf. So protection of the financial interest of the Union, although the treaty is saying, and that's also very important, that this material competence can be extended to other serious crimes. And there's already a discussion politically going on to extend it, for instance, to terrorism. So you see, this could be just the beginning of a whole new procedure when it comes to criminal investigations. So it would be, in the mind and also in the article of the treaty, it would be a European body that is investigating and prosecuting in a European dimension certain offenses investigating and prosecuting. Prosecuting is defined in the treaty as bringing to judgment. So what, in fact, a prosecutor in some countries is doing. Why do I say this? Because we have very different prosecutors' offices in the member states. You're coming, at least at the East, Eastern Europe, mostly of a tradition. It's a little bit different sometimes in Romania, but in where the prosecutor is not investigating. It's really mostly a prosecuting office, and the, investigate, the investigation is mostly done by uh, police authorities. I know in Romania it's not always the case, it depends a little bit on the offenses. In Western Europe, at least uh, also in the Netherlands, a prosecutor is investigating. He's directing also the police. 
and for some very important investigative acts, the prosecutor is present. So he's not sitting in his office waiting for the evidence coming in and the police reports coming in. So this European public prosecutor would be investigating and prosecuting. That's very important, both. I come back to that. The treaty is very clear on the limits. The European dimension would not be that these criminal cases that are investigated at the European level would be tried, adjudicated at the European court. So that means all the criminal courts and all the criminal jurisdiction remains national. That's for sure. Because um, to, bring it, to make it European is excluded by the treaty. Okay, what was, I explain you the idea and then we go to see a little bit the text and, and what the content is. The idea in such a case would be it's a little bit, let me see, can I put it here? Otherwise, so we would have I tried to explain you the structure of this new office. You would have here a chief prosecutor and the chief prosecutor could investigate, could open a case when you're in the field of substantive law and could investigate in the whole single legal area, as Olaf can. But of course, he's a judicial authority. It's of course unthinkable that a chief prosecutor, although he might have some people around him here, he can investigate so many cases in all these countries. It's completely unthinkable. So the model was, you have here your jurisdiction, so the national countries. He would have in every country a delegate prosecutor. So you have a chief prosecutor with delegates in the countries. Important, these delegate prosecutors would be part of the centralized body. So if the delegate prosecutor in the model, still speaking about the model, would investigate in the Netherlands here in my case, or in Italy in my case, he would do that by applying European law. So the offenses would be harmonized. If you say you apply investigative measures in a single legal area under European law, that means that you need a list of investigative measures that can be applied by the chief prosecutor. We have to know, can he search? Of course he can, otherwise useless. Can he intercept telecommunications? Yeah, seen the cases, of course he can. Can he infiltrate? Yes, he can. So all the special investigation techniques must be available. That means that they must be listed in the European regulation. We are lawyers, that means when you have very strong coercive measures at the disposal of such a body. That of course, there's the other side in criminal law that are the procedural safeguards. <coughs> hmm? If a chief prosecutor, through his delegate, is coming to the firm here as a judicial authority, yeah, interesting. It's yes, interesting. Uh, can he just come and have a visit? Uh, of course, he can search. These are coercive powers. So he cannot do that alone. So he needs a prior authorization by a judge. Where is the judge? <laughs> there we go. You could make a model in which the Court of Justice, so the Court of European Union, is warranting. That's possible, but complicated. So. In the model that was in the first model, I'm speaking still about the model, he could get a warrant here in the Netherlands. So that depends on national law. Of course, there should be an obligation to, to, to look at the case. So in the Netherlands, this would be an investigating magistrate that is giving the warrant. And under this model, the Dutch warrant would be valid for the whole single legal area. So with this warrant from the, the Dutch judge, he can also go to Italy, to Poland, and to Luxembourg. One decision, one warrant, and then it is executable 
in the whole single legal area. There are other safeguards. The warrant is an important one because it's a check and balances, of course. But if he has the warrant and he arrives here at here at the mafia friends, <laughs> and they want to have some searches, private homes and some businesses. Yeah, the mafia friends might be mafia friends, but they're still sus suspects at that time. So we have to treat them like suspects. They have rights. Normally they should have, if this was a classic Italian anti-mafia prosecutor, they would have rights, procedure safeguards under the Italian criminal procedure and under Italian constitutional law. But here it's a European procedure. So questions come up, do they have the right to silence? Do they have the obligation to cooperate during the investigation? Or they just can say, not my business. Do they have the right to a lawyer present during the search? And so on and so on. So all the legal safeguards which are related to fair proceedings, to fair justice, also linked to Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights, all come into play. That means if you set up such a body and you harmonize the investigative measures, you have to a certain extent also to harmonize the legal safeguards. You have to build in this warranting procedure and you have to be clear about the rights and the obligations for the persons concerned. Suspects and third parties. Because there will be also third parties. Not all of them here in my business are suspects. In the model, if the investigation is running well, and the European public prosecutor is gathering enough evidence, so, and he believes that he has a, a serious case, then at a certain moment, he has to bring the case to the court, to the criminal court. Here we have, even in the model, we have a couple of other problems, because this prosecutor has been collecting evidence in several jurisdictions. He could have intervened here in, in the criminal network, under surveillance. He has been doing searches here. They did searches in the, on the financial construction here in Luxembourg and the banks. You know, Luxembourg has bank secrecy, but when it's about this type of investigation, it's set aside. No problem. So he has been collecting evidence under European law in several jurisdictions. He brings this together in a file. And then he has to make up his mind, where will I prosecute? As I said, the courts are national. That's a difficult one because in the national laws on jurisdiction, we have clear criteria. It's mostly about uh, the territoriality, the locus, the nationality of the offender or the suspect and so on and so on. But here, this criteria, if I say, okay, the jurisdiction where the locus, so the commission of the crime, has happened. Yeah. <laughs> there are many jurisdictions where the crime has happened. So this will not be very helpful. So that means it will be very difficult in these transnational cases to make a list of criteria mandatory for the choice of the jurisdiction. In other words, this prosecutor, when he chooses the country where he will prosecute the case, and he will not, of course, open a case here, and open a case here, and open a case here. He will concentrate the case and bring it to one court. He can play with this. He could say, hmm, it's more interesting to go to the Netherlands than to Italy. You know why? Because when it comes to admissibility of evidence, the Dutch are flexible, the Italians are very rigid. They have a very protective regime, and they also have strong constitutional standards. Here, they don't care. Much easier for a prosecutor. So here, as a prosecutor, you're better off because you will not run into problems with your evidence. More risky here. However, there is a contrast. I said the material scope, the offenses are harmonized, but the harmonization is limited. 
So in the European instruments, we will find the definitions of the crime or the offense. Substantive element, material, and moral element. But the sanctions are only partially harmonized. There are no minimum sanctions. Also in the Netherlands, there are no minimum sanctions. This is rather exceptional, and also in France, there are minimum sanctions in criminal law. And also the maximum sanctions are harmonized, but we call that, it's the minimum threshold of the maximum sanction. So like this here, for organized crime linked to these economic financial offenses, the EU law will say your maximum sanctions must be at least 10 years. So that means it can be 30 years in one country, or life imprisonment in another one, or, or 15 years in another one. That's all okay, because it's at least 10. So the sanction regimes, the applicable sanctions, can be very different from one country to another. And for a prosecutor, that's very important, of course. So he can play with the evidence, and he can play with the sanctions regimes. Of course, there might be other things. It's, uh, it's much better to end up in a Dutch prison than in an Italian prison. Also in a Romanian prison. And mostly not because uh, the Italians are bad people, but, but they are overcrowded in the prison. So there's a problem of space. Also in Romania. But not only, uh, also Belgium is not here, also Belgium has a big problem of over overcrowding in the prison. So that also makes a difference. This is the model. This model has been discussed for a decade between politicians and the academic world. And then in 2013, as I said, the Lisbon Treaty is from 2009, the Commission came for the first time with an official proposal. Although the member states, of course, it's in the Lisbon Treaty, there's a legal base, they all have signed and ratified this treaty, so that means they were in favor of maybe having it, when the Commission came up with a proposal, they were not that happy about it. And the Commission is not coming up with a proposal when they had a bad night. They are negotiating that for months and months and months, otherwise it's too risky for them. But already the proposal was criticized from the very beginning. What was in the proposal? So the proposal for a regulation, 2013. Astonishingly enough, the definition of the offenses would not be in the regulation. That's strange, as if uh, your prosecutors, the first thing you want to know if I have a suspicion of an offense. What is the offense? It's for you, it's very easy, you can find it in your code, criminal code, or in special legislation. Here the offenses would not be inserted, were not inserted in the proposal of the regulation. Where are they? they are in the national jurisdiction through harmonization. So that means that the offenses that can be investigated and prosecuted by the European Public Prosecutor, of course, are related to this PIF area and maybe tomorrow terrorism or, or trafficking in human beings and cybercrime and so on and so on. But the definition of the offenses is in national law. Yeah, we know that story from Olaf. That means, although you harmonize them, that, of course, they are not the same. The substantive elements might be different. The moral elements might be slightly different. As I already said, the sanctions are not fully harmonized. So, as a European public prosecutor, you're sitting there with a European jacket, but from the very moment that you start, you first have to do comparative criminal law. Because you have to say, any offenses, how are they in the Netherlands, and how are they in Italy, how are they in Luxembourg, how are they in Poland, and then you get up with a mess. That's already very difficult. So, that was the first choice of the Commission, in fact, to change the structure of the offences and to channel it through national law, under harmonization. On the procedure, they were more courageous. <coughs> so, they listed in the proposal of a regulation a full list of investigative measures that at least should be available under national law and that could be used by this delegate prosecutor. So that means you find them in the EU regulation and they must also be present under national law. And the special investigative techniques that I have mentioned are in. 
They also harmonize to a certain extent the warranting procedure and the procedure safeguards for the, for the suspects. About the warranting procedure, it was mandatory for coercive measures, but what I've explained in the concept that the decision of this warrant in the Netherlands would be valid in Italy and Luxembourg, that remained unclear. So they were not very clear about that. When it comes to the choice of the court, in legal language you say the choice of the forum, the forum from Latin is the, the court. The text of the commission was very liberal, if I may say it like that, in the sense that the prosecutors can freely choose with a set of criteria that they are not hierarchical and not mandatory, the most relevant court to deal with the case, and there is no remedy for the suspect to challenge it. So if in my case they say we go to Italy, well, you see this firm is Dutch, the CEO is Dutch, he will be prosecuted in Italy or maybe not be very happy about it, he has no remedy against that decision. What he could do, of course, when the courts proceeding starts in Italy, he can challenge the legality of that decision under Italian law. But yeah, I wouldn't like to be the Italian judge because what can he do? He has the European law, but the European law is not giving binding criteria. He has his Italian law, but the Italian law is only saying under jurisdiction, am I competent or not? It's not dealing with the most appropriate court because it's all national. So that, I will win the, that he will win here the case in Italy, I doubt it very much. Unless there is really illegal evidence under Italian law, but that's another story, that's about the evidence. Here I'm speaking about the jurisdiction. Proposal of the Commission 2013. I go to the final text of 2017, approved and as I said, it will become in force in 2020. This text has been approved under technical uh, European language, under enhanced cooperation. That is possible under the treaty, and that means not all EU states are part of this new body. Some of them said from the beginning that they would not participate the, uh, the usual suspects, the United Kingdom, of course, because they don't have financial fraud, as you know. <laughs> no problem. Uh, because they, they are against all Europeanization in that field. Uh, Denmark uh, will not participate. Ireland will not participate. And there are a couple of players in Eastern Europe which are also not very pro-European these days, and which will not participate like Hungary uh, and Poland. And Poland. Uh, so, but that's, yeah, that's very clear. There is another one who is still in crisis, uh, politically at home, and uh, did wa not want to participate, but uh, there is a change of government, and now they, are c that they will participate, and that's exactly the Netherlands. So, for the moment being, there are 21 member states of the 28 that uh, do participate, and there might be one or two more coming in. So, that's, uh, that's quite a lot. However, from 2013 to 2017, they have been negotiating this proposal of the Commission in the working groups at the Union. And these negotiations have been very intensive, very tough, because the member states understand, of course, that this, although it's limited now to the protection of the financial interest, can become the design of the future for many, many crimes. So they have been doing everything to keep it under control. The first thing that happened is France and Germany, of course two big players, said from the very beginning in 2013 that they would never accept such a supranational model. No way, although they did accept it in the treaty. So what they, they send a letter, there you see the political strategy, they send a letter to the Commission and said this model, we don't accept it, and we should build in here 
a new structure which is called a college. So beside the chief prosecutor. And what is a college? A college is are representatives of national prosecutors. They call them European prosecutors. So that means in the building, in the central building of the chief Pro uh, prosecutor's office, there will be representatives of the national prosecutors in the college. This is the model of Eurojust. If you go to The Hague, to the Cooperation of the Prosecutor Authorities, Romania has a Romanian desk. That's of course for cooperation, that's very nice. But all the prosecutorial offices that I know are very vertical. Also in Romania, I have a chief prosecutor, Augustin Lassa, and then he gives orders, and uh, it's a vertical structure. This is a horizontal structure. So this is already very strange, but of course the maneuver is clear. Member states are bringing in national players to keep control here. I say keep control because you have to be conscious that the prosecutorial offices in the member states are very different from one country to another. If I go to a country like here, my Italian one, the prosecutors are judges, are judiciary. They're fully independent. Just like the judges. Romania is quite the same, isn't it? Yes. If I go to Spain, the prosecutors are belonging to the executive. So the government can give orders to the prosecutor not to prosecute. The chief prosecutor is changing when the government is changing. So he has very political uh, signature. So that's of course in cases like, maybe not in the example I gave, but if you go to the structural funds, this big infrastructure works. That's mostly also with co-financing of national governments. The risk of course that there, is, that there are economic financial crimes related to corruption or violations of tendering procedures is very, very high. It's an enormous flow of money. You remember that case in Slovakia a couple of months ago where a journalist was murdered and then there was a political crisis in Slovakia. I think the prime minister had to, had to, had to withdraw. You remember that case? This was about money of the European Union. It was a tendering procedure linked to, to important... Uh, important uh, infrastructure works. Who killed the journalist? The Italian Indrangheta from Calabria. So you see, if you have such a cases and your prosecutor is not independent enough, he's under political pressure of the national ministries, politics, then you might run into problems. So the representatives here will be very different from one country to another. Some of them will just be like you, independent prosecutors and judges. Other ones will be a long arm of politics. This was brought in by the Germans and, and France. And the other ones, of course, in the negotiations had to accept. The end text in two, of 2017 is even more complicated. Why? Because at the beginning, it would of course be the chief prosecutor who was opening a case, like the director general of Olaf. He would lead the investigations, of course, through his delegates. No, here in this text, the member state brought in something else. And they call it, I put it here, chambers, or chambers. And a chamber, would, there would be the chief prosecutor and one or two prosecutors from the member states, these European prosecutors. The chambers would run the case. So it's the chamber that is deciding if they open a case, what type of investigative measure they will apply, if they conclude the case, where they will prosecute. The real power from the chief prosecutor is moving to the chambers. And there he is in the minority. Interesting. Interesting. 
Last one. These delegate prosecutors in the final text are still there, but they will work under national law. Here in the proposal, they were working with European law. So that means if I apply to my case, if they want to open a case here, a criminal investigation, there must be a decision by a chamber. If this happens, then the delegate prosecutors in the Netherlands, in Luxembourg, in Italy, in Poland, if necessary, will do their work, but they will work with national law only. That means in the regulation, you will not find anymore the list of investigative measures. They're all national. You will not find anymore the harmonization of the procedural safeguards. They're all national. When I say national, that means very different from one member state to another, because they have not been harmonized. It's also very clear, of course, if you do a search in the home here of the of the legal person, and even a search in the legal person, under Dutch law, you will need a warrant. So the delegate prosecutor has to go to an, an investigating magistrate to get the warrant. But this warrant is of no value anymore here and here. So you will need a warrant in every single country. You see how European this still is. It became very, very national. Then when it comes to the prosecution of the case, so bringing to court, the text remains the same in the sense that this chamber can decide on a set of non-mandatory criteria which court is the most appropriate. There is no remedy. And then comes in something very strange. Imagine they go to the Italian court. Some of the evidence has been gathered in, 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 in the Netherlands. Um, one of the problems could be, directly, that there was an interrogation of the chief here, of the, of the CEO of the legal person. So the delegate prosecutor came in and interrogated with the police during the search, uh, the, the, the chief of the enterprise. He confessed certain things, he was so stupid. <laughs> No bar lawyer present. Key confessions. These key confessions will be used in the criminal case in Italy. If this would be a normal cooperation procedure, this evidence in Italy would be completely inadmissible. Because the presence of a bar lawyer during a criminal law in interrogation is mandatory by the Constitution. But not present. In the Netherlands, it's not mandatory. But what is the final text saying? If the evidence is gathered in this mechanism, the, 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 the evidence must be considered admissible in all jurisdictions. So what you do, you collect the stuff in all the countries, a national law with very different rules, you pack it together, and then you say to the judge, you have to accept it on admissibility. Something is, of course, the prob probative value. That's something else. But you cannot exclude it because it has been violating certain rules, even under your constitutional law. That's what the texts are saying. If this will survive, in practice, we have to see. OK, see the time. I wound up. What you see of this European Public Prosecutor's Office and certainly think about if tomorrow he is also will be responsible for other offenses. What you do have is a very strong <coughs> institutional building. In the sense, this became European. Um, there was a lot of, will be a lot of people here around that already decide where they will be established. It's in Luxembourg. But when it comes to the operational thing, of course, this is a very complex structure. Uh, in my eyes, far too complex for, a cr for cr running criminal cases. Because you have to deal with many organs here and they all have interests. Um, 
when it comes to the operational thing, you see, in fact, and you will see that back tomorrow when I speak a little bit more about Eurojust, that in fact the difference between Eurojust, the horizontal cooperation, and this model is not that big anymore. Why? Because they made it so national. So that means also when you really have transnational complicated investigations in economic and financial crimes, that a lot of the problems we have today by this model are in fact not solved. Because you have to go back to every single jurisdiction. The substantive law is partially different. The procedure law is very different. The, role, the, the law on evidence is also extremely different. <coughs> and you still have the idea that you want to concentrate the bulk of the case before one court. And you say to the court, as I said, guys, guys, <laughs> I'd be man and women, <laughs> uh, take care because the evidence you have to accept it. For you, it's admissible. So I think this model will start to work in 2020. It will be very interesting to see what cases they will bring in here. Why do I say this? Because the college is responsible in the text for what is called the criminal policy of the European Public Prosecutor's Office. And it's very clear they will not deal with every peanut. Such a, a building will deal with the most important cases. And also the member states are not stupid. They already understood that. VAT. Here we have VAT fraud involved. The member states in the negotiations, they have been saying VAT is not part of the protection of the financial interest of the Union. How can you say this? Because the Court of Justice is very clear on it. It is part of the protection of the financial interest of the Union. The member states have been selling the message. We collect it and we give a part to it, to the budget. So that means it's a national tax. We have a lot of problems in Europe with VAT carousels. Very, very serious offenses for huge amounts of damage. The member states have been doing everything to avoid that this structure is investigating VAT fraud. Astonishing. At the very end, they have not been successful, but there are thresholds now. So this, this uh, European Public Prosecutor's Office will not investigate VAT cases for less than 10 million euro hard. So there is a threshold. I don't think that there are a lot of cases which are more. So they still have enough to do. But then it will, if you have such a transnational VAT case, then it will, uh, because you have to bring in your national substantive law. There we go. So you have to go to the tax offenses. They're very different from one country to another. Very, very different. The procedure rules are different. The evidence rules are different. So if you bring down such a VAT case to one court with all the collection of the evidence through the several jurisdictions, I think we will see still, at the, certainly at the beginning, quite some interesting legal debates and legal procedures. And of course, we are speaking here about economic financial crimes. That means the bar lawyers, some of them are very specialized. They're very good. They will defend their clients and they will use all means, of course. So that, I think a lot of these cases will also end up at the court of justice not as a criminal court, as you know, but and we have very active interaction between national courts and the European Court of Justice when it comes to the applicable European law in such a criminal case. And although a lot is nationalized, there is a European regulation on it. So that means that national courts can ask to the Court of Justice uh, about how should they apply these European rules in a national case, but for instance, on the admissibility of the evidence. That's clearly in the regulation. Yeah, what does that mean to me as a court and as a judge? So I think at the beginning there will be a lot of type of these questions. I think it's a very fascinating example of how we Europeanize this investigation, but also by doing it with <laughs> a very strong impetus still at the national level. Okay, I hope that this was uh, through this practical case that it gave insight in the difference between Olaf and the EPO, uh, last work and then we, uh, last one, and then we go to the coffee break. The Olaf will not disappear. 
because they are dealing with administrative investigations. And of course, the idea would have been that OLAF for the judi judicial investigations would become auxiliary police to the chief prosecutor. That makes sense. The member states said no. No way. The assistance is here in the member states and not here. So that's also a very clear message. They don't want an effective police force with experience at the European level. They want to keep control in the jurisdictions. Thank you so much. We have a round of discussions at, I'm looking at you, Vimir, at the end of the day, isn't it? Not, not section by section now. Eh? Or, or if you want, you can have, it depends on you. But I don't want to. Were there things that were not clear? And, uh, do you have questions? You want coffee? You deserve coffee. <laughs> okay.